everyone, welcome back to another design class. Today we're going to be continuing our investigation into how exactly do Pythagorean stretches work. And before we get too far in, I want to remind you to make sure you've watched the previous video because otherwise this video probably will not make as much sense. But if you need a quick recap, basically what we learned in the previous video is that Pythagorean stretches are basically like fish bases, but because they use the Pythagorean triangles, which have rational hypotenuse lengths, Everything works together really nicely and rational. But again, make sure to go check out that video and the box fitting videos before that, uh, and then come back here and watch this video. Because in this video, we're going to talk about how do you exactly construct a Pythagorean stretch into your crease pattern. So if you remember, back to when you were in high school math class, you might remember learning how to solve quadratic equations. And you might remember that there are three ways you can do it. You can use a calculator to solve it, you can brute force it with a quadratic equation, or in certain cases, you can factor it, which is quick and elegant and can be done in your head with enough practice. And so when it comes to Pythagorean stretches, it's quite similar to that. We have our calculator method, which is a software called Box Fitting Studio. We have the brute force formula method, which no one really uses because now Box Fitting Studio will do it for you. And then we have the more eyeballing method, which is kind of like factoring because it doesn't really work for every single case, but for the times that it does work, it's pretty quick and easy, and with enough practice, can be done in your head as well. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to construct your own Pythagorean stretches into your packings using this eyeballing method in the cases that it works. And in the next video, I'll show you how to use Box Fitting Studio to do the rest of the cases, as well as also show you BP Studio's other special functions like this, the tree maker crossover thing that no one seems to know about. So let's take a look at this packing, just as an example. I got this four unit center flap, a four unit edge flap, and this three unit edge flap. And just for the sake of an example, let's say that these flaps are set, like they're part of a bigger model and you can't really move them around or change the lengths or anything. And the question is, how big of a flap can we get in this bottom corner? Well, you can say something like this and get a three unit flap here and then do a meander or something to get rid of the empty space up here. Or we could do this and get a four unit flap and fill in the space over here with a one unit flap or a meander or something. And now it might seem like that's as big as you can get because when we learned in the packing video, we learned that the squares can't overlap and this is as big as you can get without any squares overlapping. However, that rule only applies if you're sticking to pure 90 and 45 degree angles on your crease pattern then yes, the squares cannot overlap. But if you have Pythagorean stretches, it's actually not about whether the squares overlap, but whether the circles for each flap overlap. So anyways, if I ignore the boxes and just look at the circles, you can see that I can actually get a circle here that will be six units long. And we see that if I drew the box, they would indeed be overlapping. So that's where the Pythagorean stretch comes in. Because if I were doing this strictly by 45, 90 degree angle creases, this overlap would make the packing not work. But since the Pythagorean stretch is not limited to 45, 90 degrees, then we can make this work. So when we construct Pythagorean stretches, we usually talk about them in terms of just these two flaps whose boxes are overlapping, but whose circles aren't. If the circles were overlapping, then no matter what you do, there's just no way for the packing to work because there's simply you know, not enough space on the paper for the two flaps to, to, to work. So the first thing you want to check when you do a Pythagorean stretch is the area of the overlap box. So if the, if the area is even, then the pytha will work out evenly and can be eyeballed, just like how some quadratic equations can be factored easily. And if the area is odd, then you'll need some partials and some slightly more complicated structures, just like how some quadratic equations you can't factor and you have to use the formula or calculator. So in this case, the flaps are overlapping to form a two by three box. And so the area of a two by three box is six, which is even. So we know that this Pythagorean stretch will work out nicely. On the contrary, with an example like this one, where the overlap has an area of one, you see the Pythagorean stretch actually uses a partial here. It doesn't use a parallelogram, it's a little bit different. And here's another example where the overlap has, box has an area of three. And you see this one also has partials, and some weird slopes and other just overall more things to worry about. So for now, we're just going to stick to overlap boxes that have an even area 
And if you find yourself with a packing that has an odd overlap box like this one, then you can wiggle the flaps around until your overlap is even, or you can just consult BP Studio about how to do the odd overlap. So once you have that aside, once you know that your overlap box is even, we have a few rules that we have to follow in order to make sure our Pythagorean stretch works. But first, let's break down exactly what are we trying to find. So for these simple cases, at least, so in these cases where the overlap box is even, the Pythagorean stretches are going to be made up of a parallelogram and two arms. And there might be some ridges sticking out to extend the flap. So now, what are the rules we need to remember when we're constructing our Pythagorean stretch? The first rule is that the slopes of the parallelogram need to work together correctly. Now, I don't want to say complementary, or I don't want to say corresponding, because those two words have specific geometric definitions. They don't apply here. But what I mean by work together correctly is that the angle between them has to be 45 degrees on the acute corners here, and 135 degrees on the obtuse corners here. But how do you know what slopes are at these angles to each other? Now this goes back to our Pythagorean triangle stuff. So I'm going to draw the classic 3, 4, 5 triangle. But also, just to show you, I'm also going to draw a 5, 12, 13 triangle. And of course, there are other triangles that I don't know off the top of my head. But, you know, for the, the majority of cases, maybe like 75%, you can probably squeeze by on this 3-4-5 triangle. So if we measure the slopes formed by rabbit earring this 3-4-5 triangle, we get this arctan 2 line, which by the way, we basically call arctan 2 for any line whose slope is 2, negative 2, 1 half, negative 1 half, etc. And now these lines go together with the arctan 3 lines, which of course refers to lines of slope 3, negative 3, 1 third, negative 1 third, etc. So in this example, this side is an arctan 2, and this side is an R10 3. And if we measure the angles between them, this top angle is 45, just as we needed. And this side angle is 135, just as we needed. Now, if I had done something different, like R10 4 plus R10 2, then this parallelogram would not work for a stretch. This would not work. So usually, you're going to just want to stick to this R10 2 and R10 3. You know, just a quick mention for the other one we find that the, three, the 5, 12, 13 triangle yields the slopes 2 thirds and 1 fifth. So if R10-2 and R10-3 don't work, you can try this, or you can just go to the BP Studio and look it up. Now the second rule, the obtuse corners of the parallelogram need to be diagonal from the corner of the overlap box. So basically it needs to lie along these tracks, sort of. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. But the third rule we need to know is that the acute corners, the 45 degree corners of the parallelogram, need to lie along these yellow ridges that extend diagonally from the centers of the flap. Okay. So basically, can we find a solution that satisfies these three rules? So it has to be parallelograms of the correct slope and angles. The obtuse corners have to lie along these red diagonal tracks, and the acute corners have to lie along these yellow diagonal tracks. I'm just going to start up here at this corner, and I'm just going to throw something out. And this is kind of where the guess and check comes in. So I'm just going to try, I'm just going to try something. I'm going to try extending this arctan 2 slope, this line out here. I'm going to, I find that actually if I extend it, it hits the red track exactly at a grid point. So here at this grid point, I'm going to make this the corner of the parallelogram, the obtuse corner. So then I turn 135 degrees, and I do that by using a slope of R10-3 to go down, and I find that this line hits the other grid point as well. This so is now going back up on the other side of the parallelogram, the lines need to be parallel and same length. And so here we have it, we have our parallelogram completed. Now if we've done this correctly up to this point, then the arms should be super easy. The arms need to go from the obtuse corner to the corner of the overlap box, and then turn outwards, and lead, which will lead nicely into the ridge of the next lap, basically. And so at this point, we've done all the real eyeballing, and the rest of the way to finish up the packing crease pattern is actually pretty easy. I want to make sure you understand how the packing of the flap changes with the Pythagorean stretch, and how to fill in the crease pattern around it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this stretch that we just drew. I'm going to copy it over here so that it's more in context with the rest of the model. So I'm also going to continue this ridge down to the corner really quick. Nothing, no big deal. So... 
I'm going to start by fixing the hinges of the packing. So it doesn't matter what situation you're in, the rule for hinges is always the same. The hinges reflect over the ridges. So what that means is if I have my hinge like this, when it hits the, the ridge of the parallelogram, it's going to reflect over it. So when it reflect, we can use the R tool over here. And again, we reflect it for the other ridge. So now the flaps are no longer squares. And instead, we have these weird concave things for the flaps. Now let's figure out how to draw the crease pattern from this packing. So the first thing, just like before, is to remove the hinges. Then we'll use the G tool to kind of automate the grid. And we'll start with mountain closer to the edge. Now, if you're ever unsure what angle you have to use to, when filling this inside of the parallelogram, you can use this flat foldability tool here, which will look like a plus sign under the A, and you click in your vertex. And if your vertex has an odd number of lines, this tool will show you what angle the next line needs to be in order for this vertex to lie flat. And so here is telling me that it has to be in this 3 4 slope, which, of course, is related to the 3 4 5 Pythagorean triangle, yet again. And then, you know, the rest of the lines within the parallelogram will have to be parallel. So that's pretty easy. And, you know, the rest of this, the, the crease pattern, you can use the G tool, and then start fixing the mountain valley of everything, draw on the hinges, you know, pretty standard box pleating stuff. Inside the stretch is going to alternate mountain valley, and also it needs to line up with the pleats outside the parallelogram. I see here how this valley continues over to this valley, right? So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I assume it's not too bad for you, but if you have any questions, please do let me know here in the comments or over in the Discord, and I'll be happy to help you out. Basically, the point is, once you get the parallelogram and the arms, you're good to go. So let's practice this process a few more times. So we're going to do two practice situations here, and then you'll have to, uh, a few to practice on your own as homework. And I'll have screenshots of those situations on the Discord for you to access easily. So remember, the goal is for us to draw the parallelogram and the arms. And then if you want, you can practice converting it into a full crease pattern, but you don't have to. So I see that the overlap box has an area of four, so it's all good. Now, like before, I'm going to start in the top corner just to get started. It doesn't really matter where, I'm just going to start it out. So I'm going to start with a slope of 3, or a slope of 2, either one would work. But for now, let's just start with a slope of 3 and see what happens. So I think, well, should I extend it out once? Maybe I can extend it out twice? Well, if I extend it out twice, then the parallelogram would be too long, right? So I'm just going to extend it out just once, and I find that it lies exactly on the track here at the corner of the overlap. So I can already finish the arm, which will go to the overlap and then go out. Now I can continue the Pythagorean stretch by turning 135 degrees, using a slope of 2, since last time I used a slope of 3. Now I'm going to use a slope of 2. And I find that it lines up exactly at the center of the other flap. So now we just got to repeat it to finish the parallelogram, then do the arm, and this Pytha is now completed. Now this next example is a little bit different. So we see we have this river, and this river can be turning down here or doing whatever, but basically we have this flap and this river that are overlapping. So what do we do here? Well, unfortunately, Orihime has no way for me to draw arcs, but you can think of the river like it's going around the flap like this. And so in a sense, we can kind of think of it just as one big circle, or one big flap. So I'm gonna solve the Pythagorean stretch like this first, and then I'll copy and paste it over up there to show that it's exactly the same. So I see that the overlap box has an area of 12, right? So that's all good. Now, like before, I'm going to start up here in the corner again. And I'm going to start out, you know, I'll just start off with a slope of 3. I'll try something. But when I do a slope of 3, you see that we have a problem here. If I extend it out a little farther, the parallelogram is too wide. But if I extend it out, you know, a little bit back, now the parallelogram is too narrow, right? The obtuse corner needs to lie on this diagonal track, and no matter what I do, it's not going to lie on the track at an even grid point. So maybe I should go back, and instead of starting out with a slope of 3, maybe I'll start with the other slope, the arctan 2, slope of 2. So let's try that. And if I extend it out a bit, this time we find that it lies exactly on the track. 
And now we can turn it 135 degrees by using the slope of 3. And look at that. Now the acute corner lies exactly on this track as well. So now we can repeat the other sides to finish the parallelogram, connect the arms, stick them out, and we're all done. Now I'm going to redraw it over here with the setup with the river. And if it helps, I can also draw the hinges of the packing around the river. And we'll see that it's basically the same thing locally. The only difference is that maybe somewhere else on the model, we'll have another flap under, under the river or something like that. But for the Pythagorean stretch, it's exactly the same thing. Now, the thing about calling the diagonal lines tracks, you can really see what I mean when you look at a Pythagorean stretch on BP Studio. So it turns out that you can slide your Pythagorean stretch around diagonally without really changing anything, just as long as the corners stay diagonal to, you know, relative to where they are. So that's what I mean. You can imagine them like sliding around this track. So here are your homework problems, which will be posted in the design server. And by the way, I might also add or change a few. So just check the course updates channel rather than screenshot in this video. So just follow the same process and see if you can get your parallelograms and your arms just by eyeballing by hand as I've shown you today. So, you know, just a quick reminder of the three rules. Number one, the angles of the parallelogram must be 45 and 135. And you can do that by using the slopes of the Pythagorean triangles. The second, the obtuse corners of the parallelogram need to line up with the corners of the overlap box. And third, the acute corners need to line up with the centers of the flaps. So if you're able to construct this, your parallelogram in arms, there's a homework submissions channel here that you can drop a screenshot. And just make sure to spoiler them in case someone hasn't yet figured them out and wants to give it a solve for themselves first. And of course, if you want extra practice, you can fill in the full crease pattern, or you can give yourself other overlap setups to practice with. And the other designers and I in the Discord will be happy to help check your work. And if you think back to when you were learning your quadratic equations, remember how many worksheets and textbook problems your teacher probably made you do before you really got good at them? Well, you know, Pythagorean stretches are not much different. My goal for this video is for it to be kind of like that one Khan Academy video that finally made the concept click in your head and helped you understand the concept. And so if this video did help you at all, if you did learn anything, please do leave a like and share it with anyone who might be interested with this so that more people can learn from it as well. And also, keep an eye out for the next video because we'll have an in-depth explanation of BP Studio and its connection to Circle Packing and Tree Maker. And so make sure to subscribe if you don't miss that. And uh, that's it for today, everyone, and I will see you all later.